Welcome to Suzanne's studio. I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host, and tonight, by popular demand, I am introducing Dr. Alan H. B. Wu back to the show. Uh, Dr. Wu is a professor of laboratory medicine at University of California, San Francisco, as well as being such a prominent doctor. Dr. Wu is the author of five books. His last book, which we're going to talk about, is called Mind Portal. And you're just going to not be able to leave your seat when you hear about his book. Welcome, Alan. I'm so glad you're here. I had to get all of that out. Well, thank you, Suzanne, for inviting me back again. I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm really excited to tell you about my new book. It's a little bit different from the other books that I've written that we have had on the show before. Why is it so different? Well, my other books have focused on my career as a clinical laboratory scientist where we provided um, medical information for doctors to use in treating patients. I wrote these books to try to promote sort of the behind the scenes about why clinical laboratory testing is so important. But on this book, The Mind Portal, I have branched off into a genre known as speculative science fiction. Now what that means is going back into time and changing the history of key individuals in order to see what the impact might be on our world today. So it's sort of a, a what if. It's something that we really can't do. That's why we call it science fiction. But it, but it sort of allows us to sort of think about how our life might be different if we had medical knowledge of today applied to key individuals in the past. But it sounds so complicated, Alan, that you have to have so much information and knowledge, not only about who you're going to talk about, but what happens. So we've got to start telling us. Well, I have two um, major interests. Okay. One, of course, is my profession, and that's laboratory testing, which I have devoted 35 years into uh, cra crafting that science. And then the second interest is in history, history of key events, of key individuals. So I've intertwined these two interests into my portal. So who are you going to talk about? So it's about a character that I've created. Yeah. His name is Amit. And he has extra sensory perception. And we know that there are people that can do this. They can look into people's minds and they can implant ideas and thoughts and concepts that they themselves might not be able to do. And in doing so, change their behavior while they're alive. The science fiction part of this is that my character, Emit, can not only implant ideas and medical knowledge, but he can do it to people who have already died and change their behavior, change their knowledge while they are alive, and in doing so, changing history. So you're going to start with FDR? So let me tell you about FDR. Okay. 
we all know that he was uh, stricken with polio in 1921. But modern doctors today think that, in fact, he maybe didn't have polio, that maybe he had a disease known as Guillain-Barre. It's a autoimmune disease. It's when your own antibodies attack your own blood cells, your own neuronic cells. And if that is true, if in fact FDR didn't have polio, then he was misdiagnosed and perhaps mistreated. So in my story, my principal character finds out the doctor that treated FDR back in 1921 when he first contracted this disease, his legs were paralyzed. And he does a key laboratory test, as instructed by my character. Doctor, do a spinal tap on FDR. He wasn't president yet. And if the result comes out positive for proteins, consider an alternate diagnosis. Because we now know today that polio does not come with positive proteins in the spinal fluid, but Guillain-Barre does. And by doing this simple laboratory test and directing him to an alternate diagnosis, he could have lived longer than he does in actual history, FDR. So that's one of your stories. Well, so the fun part yeah, yeah, is that, yeah. all right, now let's say he doesn't die yeah. in April of 1945, which was toward the end of the Second World War, but before the end of the um, Japanese or the Pacific theater, what would life, what would history be different if he had survived? And instead of making the decision to drop the atomic bombs, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he decides to not drop the bomb. The history of the end of the Second World War could be very different today. Indeed. So then what happens? Well, so this is the fun part, is that yeah. uh, I speculate as to what might happen and what kind of a world that we'd be in today. It, it's science fiction. It's just really food for thought. Obviously, we can't go back in time. We can't do the things that my character says he can do. But it gets us to think about, wow, how important is this one laboratory test made to, to diagnose a disease in this notable figure that we know ends up having such a prominent role in our history. Who's ever thought of that but you? Well, uh, this is a, uh, a unique storyline. There have been many TV shows, yeah. many books and movies that have explored the issue of time travel. Yeah. People going back in the time, trying to change a particular event and thereby having a ripple effect on what might be the current reality. I'm not duplicating that. I'm duplicating simply that if we can improve on our medical knowledge of people in the past. So my character actually doesn't go back physically into time. He just uses his mind portal and he plants an idea onto a particular person's brain and thereby changing their behavior. Sounds pretty neat, huh? <laughs> Where is it? Quick. Uh, how many characters or pe famous people uh, have you written about in your book? So I have written about a lot of people. Let me give you some of the names. Okay. Hubert Humphrey, Arthur Ashe, <clears throat> Stonewall Jackson, King Henry VIII, Queen Anne, even Elvis Presley died before his time. Oh, could you tell us about Elvis? I love Elvis Presley. Well, so Elvis, uh, there was a movie that was just uh, turned out yes, last year, visits the White House, and he visits Richard Nixon one day, and he says, you know, I want to be an FBI agent. I want to have a badge. This is all true story. Well, F, uh, Nixon really wasn't interested in making him an, an agent. He, uh, he gives him a badge, but it's an honorary one, and he goes back into Graceland. A few years later, he starts having all these medical problems, and we now know what caused his death in an autopsy report that was released recently. I go back into time, 
and I implant ideas about modern therapies that could have saved Elvis's life from what he would have done. Um, he, would, he dies seven years later. And instead of Elvis dying early, he becomes a different person. He wanted to fight drug abuse, as witnessed by his visit to the White House. And instead of continuing his music career, he forms a rehab, drug rehabilitation center. And it's sort of like the Betty Ford of the times, mm -hmm. before Betty Ford became prominent in, in setting up these drug rehab centers. And he saves the lives of other notable celebrities, Hollywood stars, and musical um, <clears throat> musicians. And they go on and do things that they were not meant to do. Wow. How about our Arthur Ashe? I love Arthur Ashe. Well, Arthur Ashe, as we know, was a uh, champion tennis player one of the first African-American males to win the Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. <clears throat> uh, after his playing career ended, he contracted AIDS from an infected blood transfusion. He underwent open-heart surgery to repair a defect in his heart, and unfortunately, it was at a time before the blood supply was tested for the HIV virus. So they didn't know that they were infusing HIV-infected blood into Arthur Ashe. He develops AIDS, and he dies a few years later. My principal character goes back in the time, and he tells Arthur Ashe, through his mind portal, go to Stanford University to have your um, cardiac surgery. Why Stanford University? Well, it turns out that at the time, Stanford was experimenting with a new way to detect the HIV virus. This was before the blood banks were doing this on a regular basis. And had he had gone to Stanford, he would have uh, not been given the tainted HIV blood, and he would have survived. This is how the uh, history of his life could have changed. So what happened? Well, so again, this is the speculative science fiction. Yeah, yeah. Arthur Ashe was a professional tennis player. He went to college at UCLA. There was another famous athlete who went to college in Southern California. In this case, he's a football player, and he went to USC. So two famous athletes, tennis player, football player, after their careers, they became broadcasters, and they become friends, and they end up being confidants. You have Arthur Ashe, who was the calm one, and you have this football player who it was um, <clears throat> fit with rages from time to time. So Arthur realizes that this football player is a time bomb that he could do something very bad, and he wants to help him. And so one night, when the football player comes back to his old, his ex-wife's home and finds his wife having spent the night with a, a boy, a man, he goes into a rage, and he pulls out his knife, and he wants to do damage. He's out of control. But as he pulls out the blade, a little small piece of paper falls out of the blade. It falls to the floor. He picks it up. It's from Arthur Ashe. It says, call me any time if you get this message. Why would he pull out his blade unless he was going to do something bad? The football player sits back, comes to his senses, realizes that what he's about to do is not right, puts the blade back into his sheath, and he leaves the home. History has changed because of the existence of Arthur Ashe. Wow. Too bad these aren't true. Well, um, I mean, how much know, of a better world we would be in. I know. And didn't you do Henry V? Henry VIII. Eighth. Eighth. Henry, Henry VIII. Okay. Well, so we know about Henry VIII, yeah. King of England. He had 
all these wives, and when he got tired of one, he would cut their head off and marry another. He tried to get legal divorces from the Pope, but the Catholics then and today don't believe in divorce. So he was not able to get a divorce, and instead he breaks away from the Catholic Church and forms the Church of England. Okay, th these are all well-known facts. Yeah. But what is not known, what is not well-known, is that when he was a young king, maybe in his 20s, he used to entertain himself by entering into jousting exhibitions. You know what jousting is, is when the, you have these two men, they're on horses, and they have these long lances, and they're running after each other, trying to knock each other off with this large pole. One time, he, the king got hit in the, underneath the neck with the pole, underneath the mask, knocked him off the horse, fell back on the ground, he was unconscious. He suffered traumatic brain injury on that day. Those are the facts. These are, these are right. well yeah. described right. that Henry VIII yeah. had suffered what we now know today medically as traumatic brain injury. Now, what happens from that point? History showed that up until that point, he was a pretty good guy. He had, he had a loving wife, and he had no ideas of divorce, and he was very kind to his servants, to his uh, people. From that day on, historians believe that his personality changed, that he became much more aggressive, much more belligerent, intolerant, and we now have a condition that is associated with this behavior. It's called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We see that in our soldiers. We see that in our football players. We see that in anybody who's had TBI, traumatic brain injury. Yeah. So what did your character do to him? So this one was a simple one, Suzanne. Yeah. A Met goes into King Henry VIII's brain and says, you are the king. Everybody depends on you. Doing this jousting exhibition is not in your best interest. Something bad is going to happen, and it's going to change your life forever for the bad. Don't do this. He takes it to heart. He doesn't. He stops participating, and the his, English history changes from that moment on. How do you get these wonderful ideas? You're so creative in your thinking. Is that because of your, your uh, medical knowledge? Well, that's where it starts. Yeah. yeah. Um, my principal character is a professor of lab medicine like me. Yeah. And he spent his career on knowing medical information, helping create medical science. And he knows about how things, uh, how people are diagnosed with disease and how they're treated and, and how they can recover. <clears throat> and so the fun part, though, is trying to find people in history who have been uh, critical in terms of timelines for how world events unfold. And that's one premise. And the second premise is that it's something where uh, an individual dies sooner than they should have. So let's talk about Stonewall Jackson. Okay. Stonewall Jackson, Confederate general, decorated in the Civil War. He ends up getting injured, shot in his left arm by friendly fire. And back then, there was not much you could do. You pretty much had to cut the arm off in order to prevent an infection. All right, so that's what they did. And then the doctor said, you know, you've just had your arm amputated. You're very, very ill, or, or rather wounded. We, need, we are going to prescribe bed rest for you. And seven days later, he dies of, of pneumonia. At least that's what historians said at the time. Well, now modern historians think that, no, he didn't die of pneumonia. He died of a blood clot to his lung that started from his leg and traveled up. We see this today all the time. People who are immobile, 
people who take long flights on airplanes and don't get up out of their seats, people who are pregnant and have what we call a hypercoagulation state. We now know what to do about it. You don't sit and lay down. You get up and you walk around. You get your blood flowing. You prevent the clots from forming. That's not what happened in Stonewall Jackson's case. His doctor said, you need bed rest. He survives his amputation. He dies of a blood clot in his lung. Again, we don't have anticoagulant drugs then as we do today. We couldn't really treat this blood clot back in the 1860s, but it's a simple solution. Emit tells the doctor of Stonewall Jackson, you need to get up and get out of bed. All the nurses are saying, we can't do that. That's terrible. And, and, but yet he says, I don't know why, but this is the right thing to do. And of course, Jackson, being this aggressive general, couldn't wait to get up out of bed, get back to the firing squad, I mean, back to the firing line, and participate as a leader of the Confederate forces. And he survives. He does not die a week later. And what does he do? He ends up being the winning uh, general in the Battle of Gettysburg. He's dead in real history. He's not there to fight Grant in the Battle of Gettysburg. But because he survives, the history and the outcome of the Civil War is changed. Wow. All because of one decision made by a doctor related to a laboratory test, a test that says you have uh, a blood clot in your lung. And in those days, of course, they didn't know about blood clots. No, and, you know, this is all part of the speculative science yeah. fiction. Yeah. Um, today, we know this thing, yeah. and so many people now don't have this problem, as he did. Well, I can't wait to read your book. And I would think this would be number one book. I mean, how fascinating. But. I, I guess it's more interesting for people in our generation, right? Or, or not, I mean, people that, that we're s somewhat uh, familiar with. No, I, I don't agree. Oh, and really? the reason I say that is that this book contains stories of people that even the next generation and the next generation know. Oh. For example, Stephen Jobs. Yeah. Stephen Jobs, we know, died of pancreatic cancer. He underwent some very experimental therapies that really was not the best therapy for the kind of pancreatic cancer that he had. If he had just stuck with the conventional therapies, he probably would be alive today. And now the question is, what would Steve Jobs be doing with Apple today? He created iPad, he created the Macintosh, he created the iPhone. What new inventions could he have been involved with if he had been alive today? I speculate that in my book. It's applicable to the next generation. Of course. I want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing that I really want, that you've got to develop, is that thing in the, that you can stick in your brain. So this, again, this yeah. is the fun part. Yeah. I can make up anything I want. Yeah. This is speculative yeah. science fiction. Yeah. But you know that Steve Jobs was brilliant. Yeah. Oh, His personal yeah. life, maybe not so good. Yeah. But he had ideas. He had visions. And the vision that he creates is this product called iBrain. Not iPod, not iPad, iPhone. It's iBrain. It's a chip. It's a chip that you implant into your brain. And it teaches our brain how to do things, how to play a musical instrument, how to kick a soccer ball, how to look for directions without having to do GPS. It does simple things, how to speak a foreign language, that this perhaps could be something that we might have in the future. And maybe Stephen Jobs might be able to bring us that. Who knows? Boy, I sure would like to have your fertile imagination <laughs> in your IQ. We're practically out of time, and I just can't 
say enough about you, Alan Wu. You really are a young, remarkable scientist, author, doctor, really. Uh, it's a real honor to, to know you. Well, the pleasure is all mine, Suzanne. I no. love coming on your show. I love telling your audience about the things that I'm doing, yeah. and I hope that people will uh, will enjoy my stories. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you have to make me another promise. I say this every time we do a show. I, I, I can't wait to see what your next book is going to be about. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? I don't at the moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to really push this uh, yeah. envelope so that uh, I can yeah. get this book uh, into the hands of, uh, of science fiction uh, enthusiasts. Well, it's even not so science fiction. I mean, it sounds like it, it, it could have happened, you know. That's how not, I tried to write it. It's not that far out. It really isn't. And I was going to ask you one other question. When do you have time with your medicine and, you know, all the things that you do at UCSF to write your books? Well, um, I lecture at uh, different locations um, about the research that I've done. And when I'm away, that's when I write. That's uh, when I have my most creativity in a hotel room somewhere or on an airplane or traveling that uh, sometimes um, I get inspired and I write. And tell about Pam. Well, Pam is my partner for life. Yes. And she helps me with every step of every story that I read. She uh, makes sure that the uh, storyline makes sense, that uh, the flow is logical, that I'm not too much overboard with my concepts. Perhaps one of the most important things is to be sure that I don't say anything that might get me into trouble. Okay. I want to thank you so much, and I wish you only the most success anybody could have, because you so deserve it. Thank you. And I want to thank my crew. Boy, do we have a hot crew. And of course, this is so important. I want to thank our audience, our viewers, for watching. And you know what? I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye.